بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا Continuing with the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through this course of learning how to pray uh, the salah, the fiqh of the salah. Um, last week, we stopped at the point with the author, Ibn Qudam al-Maqdasi, may Allah have mercy upon his soul. He was talking about not to delay the time of the prayer. And before I continue, I'd just like to ask a few review questions quickly. Um, just try to remember the etiquettes of not jumping over each other when you answer the questions. Um, so the first question to ask is, what is the definition of salah linguistically? What is the linguistic definition of salah? No need to say in Arabic. You could just say in English, paraphrase it. Anybody there to answer that question? The linguistic definition of salah? Excellent. We said that is dua. We said that it's dua. The linguistic definition is dua. Uh, so raise your hands if you're going to answer the questions. Uh, what's the technical definition of the salah? We gave a technical definition of the salah. We said it's datul ibadatun datu aqwal wa afalin muftatahan bit takbir wa muqtata matun bit taslim. So if anybody can translate that in English, we said that it's an act of worship, compromising of statements and actions. It starts with the takbir and it's completed with the taslim. And the last question that I'd like to ask, if anybody wants to answer, how is balugh, how is maturity or the age of responsibility reached? We mentioned four things that are to be considered with regards to balugh. What are these matters? Yeah, so puberty via the appearance of the hair. What else can be said in this regard? The age, which is 15, if the age of 15 is reached. Uh, no, not that the person must be a Muslim. That's a condition for the prayer to be obligatory. I'm asking specifically with regards to um, balugh. How is balugh determined? So we said puberty. We said that the person uh, reaches the age of 15. Uh, the person has a wet dream or the woman experiences menstruation. So whichever of these come first, uh, then the person by these matters has reached balugh. So bismillah, with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we continue. So the author, he said, the last thing we took was It's not permissible to delay the prayer beyond its specified and designated times. And we mentioned as an evidence, one of them in the Quran, in Surah An-Nisa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna salata kanat ala al-mu'minina kitab al-mawquta. That verily the prayer has been established for the believers at fixed times. It's been prescribed and made obligatory at fixed times. So they have to be prayed within these times. And that is a beautiful way of us showing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our servitude to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. We show to Allah azza wa jal that no matter what we're doing in the world, no matter what has occupied us, we never get too preoccupied to remember him subhanahu wa ta'ala and to fulfill the commands that he has commanded upon us with regards to the prayer. So whatever we're doing when we hear, when we hear the call to prayer, if we're able to, we rush to respond to the call to prayer, to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within the fixed times. The author, he said after that, Illa lina Except, the author is making an exception for those who are laid to delay their prayers. He said, except for the one that is intending to join the prayers. So there's some groups of people that are, allo are, are allowed to join their prayers. From them are the travelers. So the traveler, once he's passed 80 kilometers, once he's on a journey, which is more than 80 kilometers, he's allowed or she's allowed to delay the first salah into the time of the second salah. And this is known, known as jama'at ta'khir, jama'at ta'khir, the, the joining of delaying. So for example, if you're traveling on a journey, which is more than 80 kilometers, you can delay dhuhr in the time of asr, as long as you make the intention to do so, 
uh, before the time of Dhuhr ends. So the author is saying that the person who's going to join the prayers, then this person is allowed to delay the prayer because normally you would pray Dhuhr in its specified time or you would pray Maghrib in its specified time. But if you're a traveler, for example, then you can delay those prayers of uh, Asr and you can delay Maghrib in the time of Aisha. The author, he says also, as another exception, he says, oh, mushtagilun bisharqiha, or a person who is occupied with trying to complete one of the conditions of the prayer. What, they, what the author means here, may Allah have mercy upon him, he means that for prayer, there are conditions. From the conditions is you have to have wudu. From the conditions is that you have to cover your aura, you have to cover your, your, um, your specified nakedness. Um, so, for example, with regards to wudu, a person wants to pray, but then they realize there's not enough water in the house for them to make wudu. Uh, maybe the machine that pumps the water into the tanks is not working. So this person knows that if I wait for the water to start once again, for the pump to start once again, by the time I fix, fix the, the issue, the salah time is going to be over. The author is saying because wudu is a condition for the validity of prayer, in this situation, you are allowed to delay. Likewise, for example, when it comes to covering your aura, that nudity, that part of the body which must be covered. Um, so for a, per a person who, for example, only has one thobe, and that thobe um, has now been uh, ripped for whatever reason. And so that thobe is not going to, that clothing is not going to cover that aura of that person who needs to pray. So by the time they finish sewing this uh, clothing that they have, and it's only one piece that they have, then the salah time is going to finish. So the author is saying in this situation where you are trying to fulfill a condition of the prayer and the time of the prayer is going to pass by the time you fulfill the condition, then it's allowed for you to do so. So it's allowed for you to delay the prayer beyond its time in this type of situation. But the ulama, the scholars, they mention, however, here it's conditional that the condition that you are trying to fulfill, like making wudu, getting water for making wudu, or getting your clothing sewn in order to cover your aura, that it shouldn't take too long. Yes, the time of the salah is going to pass, but it shouldn't take too much time so that it goes much beyond the time of the salah uh, that is going to pass. There's another explanation to this point, which I'd like to mention for those who are studious with regards to the Hanbali Madhab. Sheikh Abdul Salam al-Shu'ayyah, he mentions that actually what is meant by this point uh, is as Ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah have mercy upon him, explained it. What's meant by this point is the one who's allowed to delay beyond the time of the prayer. It's referring to the person who wakes up late for the salah. Because when you wake up unintentionally having slept close to the end of time, the time of the prayer, then the time for your prayer starts at the point from when you have woken up. That's when your time for the prayer starts. So from the time you wake up, Sheikh Abdul Salam al is reporting from Ibn Taymiyyah, his explanation. He's saying that it's from the time when you wake up and you have to fulfill one of these conditions, then this applies to that situation because your timing for the prayer has started at the time that you have woken up. So this is an extra point for those who are trying to study the opinions of the Hanbali Madhab. In any case, what I mentioned generally here was that um, a person, it's permissible for them to delay the prayer beyond its fixed time if they have to fulfill one of the conditions for the prayer, like getting water to make wudu, or like trying to um, fix their clothing, which has been ripped. And this is going to take them time to the extent that the time of the prayer will pass them by the time they have fulfilled this condition. However, we said that it shouldn't take too much time beyond the time of the prayer. The author, may Allah have mercy upon him, he said, If a person leaves off the prayer out of being lazy, out of carelessness, the person just doesn't bother to pray, then if this person's case is mentioned to the authorities, to the Islamic authorities, then he's going to be called and he's going to be asked to repent three times. If he's not repenting and he doesn't fix his or her way, then the person is going to be executed. So what does this mean? The scholars, they mentioned that if there's an Islamic state, there's Islamic governance, and a person is reported to, to the authorities as not being one that prays, the person just doesn't bother praying. 
So the authorities, they will bring this person in and they will say to this person, you have to stay with us for three days. And they will feed the person. They will educate the person in the nicest of manners of the importance of praying and what's associated with leaving off prayer in terms of um, punishment, etc. And they will give the person three days, a chance of three consecutive days to pray. If the person prays one prayer, they will let him go. But if the person refuses to pray, knowing that there is a punishment, a capital punishment, so he's been educated and he's been coerced, and he's being um, you know, spoken to nicely and encouraged that you have to pray for three days consecutively, and the person still refuses to pray, knowing that he's going to now face execution, then the scholars say that this person, in fact, actually deserves to be executed as a non-Muslim, as one who has left the fold of Islam, because it's impossible to imagine that a person knows that there's the threat of execution upon them, and all they have to do is pray one prayer and they will go home safely, and they refuse to do that, rather they choose to be executed. So this person is from the worst and of obstinate disbelievers in the regulations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is what this statement of the author means, and this can only take place if there is an Islamic governance. It can't take place in any other situation, okay? It's not upon a group of people in the community to get together and to, to establish this type of ruling. It's only if there is Islamic governance and the case of a person is brought to the authorities, then this is what will take place. So by that, we move on now to the next uh, chapter that the author is going to mention in the book of prayer. The author now is going to start to speak about Babul Adhan Wal Iqama, the chapter pertaining to the Adhan and the Iqama. Linguistically, the Adhan, it means Al-I'lam, Al-I'lam, which means to make an announcement. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Tawbah, verse 3, a part of the verse, مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ إِلَى النَّاسِ يَوْمِ الْحَجِّ الْأَكْبَرِ That there is an announcement, a proclamation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger to the people on the day of Hajj al-Akbar, on the great day of the Hajj. Okay, so there is an announcement. So this is the linguistic meaning of the word Adhan. Technically, Adhan is At-ta'abbudu lillahi ta'ala Technically, the meaning is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by announcing the adhan with specific dhikr, with specific uh, words of remembrance. So it's worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala via making an announcement of the adhan with specific uh, words of remembrance in the time of salah. The author, he says, The author, he said, may Allah have mercy upon him, that the adhan is legislated for the five daily prayers and not prayers other than, than those. So, for example, you have a prayer like the Eid Salah, the adhan is not legislated for that. You have a prayer like the prayer for rain, the adhan is not legislated for that, and others similar to that. The prayer of the... Um, the Janazah Salah, the Adhan is not legislated for that either. Rather, the Adhan is legislated, it's obligatory for the five daily prayers, including the Juma Salah. So now, in Islam, in the rulings of Islam, we have legislation, we have something which is obligatory, known as Fard, Fard or Wajib. Fard is that which is obligatory and it has to be done. So we have two types of Fard. We have what is known as Fardul Ain. Fardul Ain is that which is specific to every single individual. If they don't do this obligation, then they are going to be sinful. And then we have a second type of Fard, the second category of Fard, which is known as Fard Al-Kifaya. Fard Al-Kifaya. Fard Al-Kifaya is a communal obligation, meaning that if one person in the community fulfills, or a group of people in the community fulfill this particular obligation, depending upon what it is, then this is removed from the necks of the rest of the community. However, if nobody in the community fulfills this obligation, then everybody in the community is sinful until it is fulfilled. So the first type, the fardul ayn, the uh, obligation which is upon every individual to fulfill, is like the prayer. So if a person doesn't fulfill this obligation, then they are sinful. The second type is like the one we are speaking about now, the adhan, is fardul, uh, fardul kifaya. Fadlul kifai is the communal obligation. So if there is a sufficient amount of people in the community that fulfill this need, then it's not going to be a responsibility upon the necks of the rest of the community. 
But if nobody in the community does the adhan, then everybody in the community is going to be sinful. And we take this from the hadith, which is mentioned in Bukhari, the hadith of Malik ibn Huwairith radiyallahu anhu, who said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, فَإِذَا حَضَرَتِ الصَّلَاةُ فَلْيُؤَذِّنْ لَكُمْ أَحَدُكُمْ وَلْيُؤُمَّكُمْ أَكْبَرُكُمْ That when the prayer, when the prayer time comes upon you, then one of you should make the adhan. And then one of you, the eldest of you, should lead you in the prayer. So where the Prophet Sallallahu said in this hadith in Bukhari that one of you should make the adhan, it shows us that it's fardul kifaya. It's a communal obligation that somebody in the community must fulfill. Like some points with regards to the calling of the adhan. If the adhan itself or the iqama is forgotten, then the ulama, the ulama they say, yasqut al wujub bin nisyan, that the ob uh, that the legislation or the oblig obligation of the adhan in the iqama is overlooked due to forgetfulness. So if a particular community, they forget to, the mu'adhan forgets to make the adhan in the iqama, then the salah is still going to be valid without that. And the obligation is overlooked due to the fact that it was done forgetfully. Another point is that it's mustahab, it's recommended for a person if they are alone somewhere, and they are going to pray that they make the adhan and the iqama. If they are alone, if they are out somewhere praying in a field or something of that nature. A third point, if a person has many prayers that they have to make up, prayers that have been missed, then they make one adhan in the beginning of the sequence of the prayers that they're going to make up, the five or four or three prayers that they're going to make up, they make one adhan, then they make an iqama for each particular prayer after that. Okay. Another very important point to mention, the, the fourth important point, is that a recorded adhan, a recorded adhan doesn't suffice the community in terms of lifting the obligation. So if the adhan which is being played is a recorded adhan, this doesn't suffice because the person is not making an intention at the time of calling the adhan, at the time of the uh, prayer. At the time of the prayer, the intention is not there if it's a recorded Adhan. This was mentioned by Shaykh Ibn Thaymin, may Allah have mercy upon him, in his Majmu' al-Fatawa, volume 12, page 188. However, if there is a live Adhan, meaning that an Adhan is taking place on the TV or on the radio, and at the time of the prayer, whoever shares that time of prayer and hears the Adhan, then that Adhan can suffice them. If it's one Adhan, which is for a particular locality, or a particular land, and they all share the same time of a particular prayer, then that one adhan which is being done live on the internet or on the radio or on the TV, then that is sufficient for everybody else in the community because it's a live adhan and they all share the same time of that prayer. The author, may Allah have mercy upon him, he said that the adhan is an obligatory command upon men, not women. It's upon men to make the adhan and not upon women. So now the sisters or any sisters listening to this may think, well, what's the point of me learning the fiqh of the adhan if it's not an obligation upon me? It's still super important for you to learn the fiqh of the adhan. Why? Because in the future, you're going to be a scholar. In the future, you're going to be a scholar in your community, inshallah. And there will be at times nobody to answer the questions apart from you. So it could be that the men, they need to learn from you. But for sure, there's going to be opportunities that the men in your families, those who are mahram for you, those who are allowed for you to interact with from your sons, from your nephews, from your uncles, and even from your uh, husbands, they're going to need to learn how to call the adhan. And because you have the knowledge of the fiqh of the adhan, and you know how to teach the adhan, then you're going to get an immense amount of reward. Why? Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the hadith in Sahih Muslim, narrated by Abi Mas'ud al-Ansari radiyallahu anhu, who said that the Prophet Sallallahu said, man dalla ala khayrin falahu mithlu, fa mithlu ajri fa'ilihi, that whoever guides to good, then he or she gets the same reward as the one who is doing that good. So if you teach a person, you teach your children, the male children, you teach your male family members to make the adhan, now, every time they make the adhan, wherever they are, you are getting the reward of the adhan. Can you imagine? So if you have five sons, if Allah's blessed you with five sons, then those five sons, they grow up. 
And then they all make the adhan five times a day in different places. So you get the reward of each one of those calls to prayers. So you have a huge amount of reward on your scale in the, on the day of judgment. So do take care to learn the fiqh and to not get bored by it, knowing that it's not an obligation for you because there's still an opportunity for you to implement this fiqh and to get a huge amount of reward. The author, he says, that the adhan is 15 sentences. The adhan is 15 sentences, meaning that the adhan that he's chosen, the adhan of Bilal, radiyallahu anhu, and the one that he's going to teach is 15 sentences. And so a point to mention when he says that it's 15 sentences, it means that we should stop. It's highly recommended to stop at each sentence and not to join them. So for example, when you make the adhan, you don't say Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. You say rather Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. So if you notice, I stopped at the end of the sentence rather than in the first example where I joined them. So this is how the adhan is to be made. Uh, highly recommended to do so, that at the end of each sentence, the adhan, the, the person stops on that before starting the next sentence. The author, he said, لا ترجيع فيه. There is no tarji' in this adhan that he has chosen. Otherwise, there are reports where the tarji' is permissible. For example, you have the hadith of Abi Ma'jura, radiyallahu anhu, who used to do it, and it was accepted from him. But our author, may Allah have mercy upon him, is saying no tarji. And what is this word tarji? Tarji is that you say the shahadatain, you say the two testimonies of faith. So you say, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. And then what you do is that you repeat it to yourself quietly. So after having said it loudly, you then repeat it to yourself quietly, the two testimonies of faith. So this, the word tarji comes from this meaning of returning. Because the person is returning from loud, saying it quietly, and then going back to saying it loud. So there's no tarjiyah. There's no repetition of the uh, two testimonies of faith. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. It's not to be said quietly after it's said loudly. However, if the person does do it, then there's no sin upon them. As we said, it is mentioned in other versions of the adhan. But our author and in general, the humbly scholars, they said it's not recommended to do it. The author, he said, well, The iqama itself is to do the adhan, to do the iqama. Uh, the iqama is that which is said before the prayer is about to uh, take place. Okay, the iqama is 11 sentences. So the difference between the iqama and the adhan is that the adhan has 15 sentences and the iqama will have 11. So in the iqama, you say Allahu, ak Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, twice, instead of saying it four times. Then you say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, once, instead of saying it twice. Then you say, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, once, instead of saying it twice. Then you say, Hayya ala salah, once. Then you say, Hayya ala al-falah, once. Then you say, Qad qamati salah, qad qamati salah. And then you say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. So this is how the iqama is to be done, and that is the difference between the iqama and the adhan. The author, he says, وَيَنْبَغِي أَنْ يَكُونُ الْمُؤَذِّنْ أَمِينًا It's imperative that the, that the one who is given the adhan, he's trustworthy. So it's something, it's an imperative um, description that must be in the mu'adhin, that the mu'adhin is a trustworthy person. Why? The Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the hadith collected by Imam Ahmad and Abi Dawood, he said, Al-Imam Mudhamin wal Mu'addin Mu'taman. That the Imam who leads the prayer is Dhamin, meaning that he guarantees your prayer. Meaning that any mistakes that you make behind the Imam, the Imam is going to be the guarantor of your prayer to be correct because you are praying behind him. He kind of guarantees your prayer to be correct. Whereas the Mu'addin, the Mu'addin is one who is to be trusted. So, question to yourselves. What does it mean that the Mu'adhin is to be trusted? Why is it that the Mu'adhin has to be somebody who is trustworthy? Excellent. Very clear. Very good. So it's regards to the Salah timings. He has to be trustworthy in the sense that he has to be honest and he has to be punctual with regards to the Salah times. Because if he makes the Adhan before the time has come, before the time has come in, then our prayers will be invalid. 
So that's imperative. And also the scholars, they say that in the past, it used to be the case that the mu'addin before microphones were existent or in places where there's no microphones, the mu'addin, he would climb the minaret and call the adhan so that his voice could spread as far as possible. The higher up you are, the more likely it is that your voice is going to spread far and wide. And so due to that, it was possible, possible for the mu'addin to easily look up into the houses and see the women that were not un- covered properly. So if the mu'addin was somebody who was evil, it was easy for him to do that. So that's why the ulama said that the mu'addin has to be somebody who is trustworthy so that the times would be done at the correct time. And also in the situation that I described, the person wouldn't have evil intentions. Also the author, he says, sayyitan. Sayyitan, that the person, it's imperative that he is sayyitan. Sayyit means that the mu'addin has a loud, strong voice. Obviously, a loud, strong voice so that people from a distance can hear the adhan. However, today the ulama, they say, because microphones are available, it's not so important that the person has a a loud, strong voice because the microphone itself will do that job for the person. However, some scholars, they add an important point here. They said that it's good for the person to have a nice voice, not a voice like mine, which is croaky, not a voice which some muaddin they have, sadly, is like, you know, a cat is being stepped on and it's a really kind of really shrieking sound because you got to remember that the adhan is a type of dawah. You are calling people, you're calling the Muslims to come and pray. And also non-Muslims are hearing that beautiful call uh, to the salah. And if it's done with a nice voice, if it's done with a good voice and in a good manner, then it can have a good effect on the souls and the hearts of Muslims as well as non-Muslims. So in fact, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to choose from a variety of different people who should be the mu'adhin. So people in the masjids, they shouldn't be arrogant. They shouldn't, they should have the humility to recognize who amongst them has good sound, good voice, and a good knowledge of how to pronounce the adhan in a proper way. And they should be willing to step back and allow that person to come forth and to deliver the adhan for the reasons that I mentioned. And in fact, this point that I've mentioned is so important, it should apply to everything that we do for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whoever is doing dawah, for example, if you've been in a place where you have been in charge of delivering lectures for 10 or 15 years, but then somebody comes to your community and they are more knowledgeable than you and better than you in terms of delivering a lecture or organizing lectures, for example, then you should be happy to step back and allow that person to step forward. Why? Because they're going to do a more productive job than you. And you want that to be the case for the sake of Allah's religion to spread and for the sake of Allah's religion to be served in the best of manners. The author, he also mentions now that a thing which is uh, important for the mu'adhin, for the caller to have is aliman bil awqat, that the person should have knowledge of the times of prayer. However, this is not something which is obligatory. Why? Because we see in the seerah, we see in the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that uh, one of the mu'adhins of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ibn Maktoum radiallahu anhu, he was blind. And so the fact that he was blind means that he couldn't tell uh, from looking at the sun what, what the times of the salah was. Rather, he would have to wait upon somebody to come and tell him what the time of the salah was, what time of the, which salah is coming in now. So based upon this, the ulama, they said that a person doesn't have to know the times of the salahs. It's highly recommended, but it's not a condition. Rather, as long as the person has, has access to somebody that can tell him the time for the salah, or the person has access to timetables which have been verified by the Islamic bodies, the Islamic government, or the Islamic bodies which are in charge of the community, then that suffices the person. He can rely upon those. The author, the author he says, well, you and you It's mustahab. This word we keep hearing it, mustahab, yustahab. So what does this word mustahab mean? Mustahab, it means ma yuthabu fa'iluhu wa la yu'aqib tarikuhu. That which the person, if he does it, or she does it, they are going to be rewarded. But if they leave it off, they are not going to be punished for it. So it says, the author, he says, well, يُسْتَحَبُّ and يُؤَذِّنْ قَائِمًا It's recommended, it's mustahab, that the caller, the mu'adhin, he makes the adhan whilst he is standing. Because this is how the companions, radiyallahu anhum, used to do it. The companions of the Prophet sallallahu used to do it. However, if you see somebody not doing it, you shouldn't get upset. You shouldn't throw your shoe at them. 
because it's permissible for them to do it whilst they are sitting down, but it's khilaf al-awla, it's opposing that which is better. Better is to do it standing because it was the way of the companions. But if somebody does do it sitting down for whatever reason, then we shouldn't attack the person. We should try to encourage them later on to do it standing up. Um, a point to mention for those who are a bit more advanced in the study, a ta'lil for the reason for standing in the iqama. Ta'lil for standing in the iqama. Ta'lil is a reasoning. Uh, and the reasoning for standing when making the iqama, apart from the fact that the companions of the Prophet ﷺ did it, an interesting point which is mentioned in the book Hidayat al-Raghib, the explanation of Umm al-Talib, is that the one who is established in the iqama, qad qamat salah he is calling the people to stand up and now come and pray. He's telling the people to stand up. And it's from the etiquette of one who is calling people to do a good action that he or she be the first amongst the people to rush to do that good action. So whenever you are calling people to do an act of worship, any act of good, you should be from the first amongst them to do it yourself. So this is a ta'lil that the ulama mentioned for one of the reasons why the person gives the iqama should also be doing it standing up. Because Allah mentions in the, in the Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah, أَتَأْمُرُونَ النَّاسَ بِالْبِرِّ وَتَنْسَوْنَ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ تَتْلُونَ الْكِتَابِ Do you command people to do good whilst you are forgetting it to, to do it your own selves? This is something which is blameworthy. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that in the Quran. طيب, the author, he said, وَمُتَطَحِّرًا That the, it's highly recommended that the person, when he gives the adhan, that he should be in a situation of tahara, that he should be in a situation of tahara, of purity, meaning that he should be free from hadith uh, al-asghar, he should be free from that which is required for him to make wudu. Or let me simplify that, he should be in a state of wudu. Why is it that the person, it's recommended that he is to be in a state of wudu when making the adhan? Question to yourselves. It's because this is the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, this is the dhikr, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said in the hadith, which is collected by Imam Ahmad and Abi Dawood, reported by Muhajib ibn Qanfad, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, was given salam to by this companion when he was making wudu. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa did not reply the salam to this man until he finished making wudu. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I disliked to mention the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except upon a state of purity, except unless and until my wudu was made. So because the adhan is a form of dhikr, it's highly recommended that the person is in a state of wudu uh, when they make this adhan. However, it's not obligatory upon them to be in wudu. Excuse me. Also, the ulama, they mentioned that the junab, the person who has janaba, is in a state of janaba. Janaba is a state that you have after you have marital relationships with your spouse, or you are, in a, you are a person who, has, uh, who is experiencing, actually it wouldn't apply because the women cannot make that then. It would only apply to those who have a sexual intercourse. Uh, this is how you have janaba. You, you are in the state of janaba. So it's disliked. It's highly disliked for the person to be in a state of janaba when they make the adhan. Moving on, the author, he said, Ala that it's recommended, it's mustahab, that the person, he makes the adhan from a high place. Why? Because so that the voice can travel as far as possible. But as we said today with the microphones, if the microphones are available, then obviously this is not so important. The author, he says, it's recommended مستقبل القبلة, that the adhan is to be made facing towards the qibla, in the direction of the qibla. This is something which is recommended and it's disliked not to do it in the way in facing the qibla because this is how the companions, radiyallahu anhum, they used to make the adhan and it's re recommended that any act of worship that you do, you do it facing the qibla. Whether you, you do it uh, facing the qibla, whether you are doing, uh, making dua, whether you're reading the Quran and any other act of worship, it's recommended to do it towards the Qibla, if possible. The author, he said, When the person comes to the point where the, the, he's making the Adhan, where he's making the Adhan, then the person should turn to the right, 
and then he should also turn to the left. So part of it, you say hayya ala salah to the right, and when you say hayya ala al-fala, you turn to the left. Or you can do one hayya ala salah to the right, and you can do one hayya ala salah to the left, and then you can do one hayya ala al-fala to the right, and one hayya ala al-fala to the left. You can do it both ways. Tayyib. Uh, some of the scholars, um, contemporary scholars, they say that because many people today, they make the adhan on the microphone, it's not recommended for them to do this. It's not recommended for them to turn to the right or to the left. Why? Because when you're making adhan on the microphone, if you turn away from the microphone, then your voice is going to be lessened. Your voice is going to be diminished. So they say maybe it's better not to do that if you are making the adhan on the microphone. And others, they say, no, it's better to continue to do it because this has always been the practice of the Muslims when making the adhan. At this point of the hayya ala swala, hayya ala al-fala, they turn to the right and they turn to the left. Tayyip. The author, he said, wala yazilu qadamayhi. When the author is, when the uh, mu'adhin is making the adhan, he doesn't allow his feet to turn away from the qibla. Why? Because then it goes away from the recommendation from the virtue of the person's body facing the Qibla when making the Adhan, if the person allows his feet to turn away from the Qibla. He says, the author, fi The person making the Adhan puts his fingers into his uh, eardrums. Why? Because the ulama, they say that this allows for the Adhan to increase in power, in, in, in volume. Uh, it kind of helps the person to uh, increase in making the Adhan. And also some of the ulama, ulama mentioned because if somebody was to see somebody from a distance, they would know that this person is making the adhan. In any case, this is the actions of Bilal, the companion who used to make the adhan. So it's something which has been established from the time of the Sahaba. May Allah have mercy upon them. The author, he said, وَيَتَرَسَّلْ فِي الْأَذَانِ يَتَرَسَّلْ فِي الْأَذَانِ Meaning that the person makes the adhan slowly. He doesn't rush the adhan too much, nor does he make the adhan too slowly to the extent that it goes against the dictates, dictates of the Arabic language. He doesn't prolong the pronunciation of certain words in the Adhan so that it becomes against the dictates of the Arabic language. He does it in a, in a normal manner, uh, which is accepted by the Arabic language. Okay, And the reason that he takes his time with regards to Adhan, because you're trying to announce something to people that are far away. And when you announce something to people which are far away, you're raising your voice, it means that you're going to need to take your time in pronunciation. وَيَحْضُرُ uh, الْإِقَامَةِ And the iqama, when you say قَدْ قَامَةِ الصَّلَاةِ When you make the iqama, you make it quicker than you make the adhan. Why do you make it quicker than you make the adhan? Why do you think? Obviously, it's because the people are now present in the masjid. They're, they're ready to pray. And therefore, the iqama can be made quickly. But again, it shouldn't be made so quickly that the person stumbles over his words or, uh, and, and the words are not pronounced correctly. The author, he says, in the morning adhan, the adhan for Fajr, the person says the following, that after you hear in the adhan, sorry, the muadhan, when he makes the adhan and he's finished saying, hayya ala sala, hayya ala al-fala, then he says, as-salatu khaydu min al twice, that prayer is better than sleep. This is known as tathweeb. So prayer is better than sleep. It's a beautiful reminder to the believers that whatever they're enjoying in terms of their dreams and whatever they're enjoying in terms of their sleep, then for them to leave their sleep and to respond to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to worship him by praying the Fajr is so much better for them in terms of reward. Okay? Like the Prophet sallallahu said, Man sallal fajr fil jama'ah fa innahu fi dhimmatillah. Whoever prays the Fajr in congregation, then he is or she is in the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the rest of that day. So praying Fajr on time has so many huge rewards, okay? Uh, so as we said that the person says, Salatu khayru min al twice after hearing the hayya ala, hayya ala salah, hayya ala al-falah, after saying the hayya ala. Tayyip. The author, he says, Wala yu'adhinu qabla al-waqt illa laha. That the salah, the adhan for the salah is not, is not to be given unless and until the time for that particular salah has come in. Okay, except for the Fajr prayer. It's allowed for the Fajr prayer that the Adhan can be made like uh, after the time of Isha has finished. Okay, 
The reason being is because in the hadith of Sahih Muslim, the Prophet وسلم, said, Inna Bilal bilayl, fakulu wa shrabu hatta yu'adhinu ibn um maktum. That Bilal, he makes the adhan during the night, meaning once the time of Isha has been finished, and he makes the adhan before the time of Fajr has come in. So the Prophet وسلم, said, continue to eat and drink in the time of Ramadan until Ibn Um Maktum, the blind companion, makes the adhan. For all, he will make the adhan when people tell him that the time for the salah has now been established. So there are places which still establish this sunnah, which is that there should be two adhans for uh, Fajr. The first adhan is before the time of Fajr. It's to remind the people who haven't yet prayed witr that they should get up and pray witr, or for the people who are praying Qiyam al that they should soon stop and get ready for Fajr, or for those people who are taking suhoor, the dawn, the pre-dawn meal in Ramadan, that they should soon get ready to stop. So that's the wisdom behind having an adhan before the time of Fajr has come in. And once the time of Fajr has come in, then of course you have the adhan as it should be given at the correct time. The author, he says, It's recommended for the person who hears the mu'adhan to say as the mu'adhan is saying. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ in Bukhari, it's mentioned by Abi Sa'id al-Khudri, this hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said, um, okay, If you hear the call to prayer, then say like the mu'adhan is saying, because then you get the reward of saying what the, of, of the reward of the one who's calling the adhan. So whenever you hear the adhan being called, then you should also make a repetition of the adhan uh, after it's after the mu'adhan, because then you will get the same reward, inshallah, by Allah's permission, based upon this hadith in Bukhari. Tayyib, with regards to you repeating the adhan, there is an exception when the, when the mu'adhan, he says, hayya ala salati, hayya ala al-fala, you shouldn't then say hayya ala salah, and these two phrases you should say instead you should say the which means that there is no might or power there is no ability of movement and response except by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the mu'adhan is telling you come to the salah come to that which is success all success lies in the prayer and you are saying la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah that there is no might or power there is no ability except with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so these beautiful words remind yourself at this particular point which is very pertinent because you are recognizing that you can only obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you can only respond to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a gift from Allah azza wa jalla if Allah allows you to respond to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if Allah guides you to the action this stops you from being arrogant so whenever you do good deeds, you never become arrogant because you remember that it was only from the power and the permission and the gift and the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I actually did these good deeds. Without the permission of Allah, without his guidance, I would never have been doing these good deeds. I would have been living a life other than the life of worship that I am now living. So this is why the person says, instead of saying, when repeating the adhan, they would say, After the adhan has been said, and the person has repeated the adhan, then the person will make dua. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, uh, in Sahih Muslim, Once you hear the adhan, the Prophet ﷺ said, um, then say like the Mu'addin is saying and then make salah upon the Prophet Wasallam. so after having made um, after having repeated the adhan you make salah Allahumma salla Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahima wa ala Ali Ibrahima inna kahmidun majid you make salah upon the Prophet Wasallam, and then you can go ahead and you can make any dua that you want and also the Prophet Wasallam said that we should say the following dhikr which is very important in the hadith of um, in the hadith in Bukhari where the Prophet وسلم, said um, man whoever says when they hear the adhan Allahumma rabba hadhi da'wati tama oh Allah the Lord of this perfect and complete call wa salati al-qa'ima and the Lord of this prayer which is about to be established ati Muhammad al-wasila give Muhammad the wasila and the fadila 
وبعثهم مقاما محمودا and send him forth to the maqam al mahmud الذي وعدته الذي وعدته that which you promised حلت له شفاعتي the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said then this person who says these words then intercession from me for this person on the day of judgment will be valid this person will receive my intercession by Allah's permission on the day of judgment if he says these words اللهم رب هذه الدعوة التامة وصلاة القائمة آتي محمد الوسيلة والفضيلة وابعثه مقاما محمودا الذي وعدته okay the word wasila as mentioned by the ulama it's a rank or a place in jannah and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said it's a high rank and place in jannah that is only for one of the slaves of allah azawajal and i hope that person is going to be me as mentioned by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in sahih muslim and the word fadila as mentioned by imam ibn rajab in his explanation of sahih bukhari he said it is to show the status of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam on the day of judgment that you are asking allah azawajal that you give the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the fadila that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam status and nobility is shown to all of the creation on the day of judgment and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in the hadith in sahih muslim and the sayyid walid adam yawm al qiyamah wa la fakhr i am the best of the creation on the day of judgment from the sons of adam and this is not being said out of arrogance the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in sahih muslim and the maqam al mahmud the maqam al mahmud is a position um, wherein the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would be the only one who has that position meaning the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the only one that would be given the ability to make shafa'ah the ability to make intercession with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so it's not that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam makes uh, intercession for anybody he wishes rather it's that he makes it with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, permits whether it's the major shafa'ah or the minor shafa'ah the intercession طيب um, another point to mention before we finish is that the person after hearing the adhan between the adhan and the qama the person uh, should make lots of dua as we mentioned and the person should also pray two rak'ah why because in bukhari and muslim from the hadith of abdullah ibn muwaffil radiyallahu anhu the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said bayna kulli adhanain salatun bayna kulli adhanain salatun bayna kulli adhanain salatun the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said between two of the adhans meaning that the actual adhan and the iqama there is a prayer there are two rak'ahs and then the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in the third time bayna kulli adhanin salatun liman sha for the person who wishes to do so that if you wish to do so there are two nafal two supererogatory prayers that you can pray two units uh, between the adhan and the iqama so this is something which is also recommended to do as well as making as much dua as you possibly can Because making dua between the adhan and the qama is a time when your dua is likely to be answered. Uh, a few more points before we finish. Um, the ulama they say that if a person enters the masjid and the adhan is being called, then they shouldn't pray what is known as tahiyatul masjid, the two units of prayer which are prayed once you enter the masjid, and these units are obligatory. Rather, they should listen to the adhan, and then when the adhan is finished, then they go ahead and pray. except on the day of juma at the time of the second adhan before the khutbah if the person enters the masjid and it's the second adhan before the khutbah what they should do in this situation they shouldn't listen to the adhan they should quickly pray the two units of prayer and then they should sit for the khutbah in this situation the ulama they mention as a point also that the adhan has to be completed by one person two people cannot share the adhan also the ulama they mention that the person does not have to be baligh to do the adhan rather a person can be mumayyiz mumayyiz that a person reaches around the age of 7 or 10 and they know the difference between right and wrong they are able to take instruction so the person doesn't have to reach balugh rather it can also be a child that can make the adhan as long as they are mumayyiz they have reached past the age of 7 and they are able to distinguish between right and wrong and take instruction the adhan it should have tartib and muwalat tartib is that it has to be done consecutively in order as it's normally given the order should never change and also there should be muwalat muwalat is that there should be continuity between the sentences there shouldn't be a big gap that somebody is making that adhan and therefore for whatever reason he has a two minute daydream before he makes the next sentence then this would invalidate the adhan there has to be that muwalat which is continuity so also one last point to mention that if somebody hears uh, the adhan Uh, for a particular salah and they've already prayed this particular salah say for example you had the adhan 
uh, for Dhuhr after you've prayed Dhuhr. So you go, you drive, and then you go to a masjid, past the masjid, which for whatever reason delayed the call to prayer. So then they call the prayer to Dhuhr. You should not repeat that adhan. Why? Because you have already fulfilled the call to the prayer, because you already responded to the call by praying that salah. So if you've already prayed the salah, you do not then respond to another adhan, which is for that same time prayer. However, if you are in the bottom, for example, and you were unable to respond to the adhan, then you respond to the adhan once you come out of the bathroom. This is what we have to say today. We'll stop here, inshallah. Anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The shortcomings and mistakes were for myself and shaitan. I hope I haven't been too complicated. Uh, over complicating things but I did say I'm going to try to do it at a variety of levels and you can also go back to the recordings and take from the recordings and the beginner student of knowledge all they have to worry about is understanding the actual text that's the first step of seeking knowledge in our journey as beginners and anything that you can take from above that is all well and good and virtuous inshallah if you have any questions on the topics that we've taken today please type away can women make iqama or adhan home alone? No, women should not make the adhan or the iqama, according to the humble scholars, even if they're home alone. How can women gain the reward for fajr jama'ah that men do? The women would still gain a huge amount of reward for having prayed at home, even if they were in the Prophet Sallallahu masjid, even if they were in Mecca. For them to pray at home instead of going to the masjid, they would gain the same amount of reward as the men who are going to the masjid because the Prophet ﷺ said that the best of prayers for the women is in her house. So by you fulfilling the command of the Prophet ﷺ on the recommendation of the Prophet ﷺ by praying at home, you will get the same amount of reward that the men get by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah loves to reward. So if we cannot hear the adhan and we rely on timetable, when do we make dua and dua for the Prophet ﷺ? If you cannot hear the adhan, then you don't make dua in this situation because this dua and the repetition of the adhan is conditional upon hearing the adhan. And alhamdulillah, there's so many times throughout the day when you came in dua to Allah Azawajal and salah upon the Prophet Sallallahu In fact, the more salah you make upon the Prophet Sallallahu the more virtue and barakah and blessings you will have in your life. When we repeat the adhan, must we also be facing the qibla? So must is not the correct word, but it's highly recommended that you face the qibla. It's not a must, but it's highly recommended. Is salawat upon the Prophet ﷺ, wajib or sunnah? Uh, if you are referring to after the adhan, the salawat upon the Prophet ﷺ is not wajib, it's highly recommended. And it's highly recommended for you to make much salah upon the Prophet ﷺ because the Prophet ﷺ in the long hadith, he mentioned to, to a companion who was saying, Ya Rasulullah, I'm going to make some, so much salah upon you. The Prophet ﷺ said, Idan hammak wa yughfar laka dhambak. In that case, then all of your woes and worries will be sufficed and all of your sins will be forgiven. So making much salah upon the Prophet ﷺ is something which is extremely virtuous, but it's not something which is obligatory unless it's in the salah or unless you hear the name of the Prophet ﷺ. Is it important to know what madhab, the fiqh, is being presented from for a student, for a beginner student of knowledge and quote-unquote student of knowledge, right? For a student of knowledge, it's good for you to know that this is taken from the Hanbali madhab uh, based upon the teachings of one of the imams of the Hanbali madhab and one of the imams of Ahlul Sunnah in general, who is Imam Ibn Qudam al-Maqdasi. That's if you're a student of knowledge, taking the journey to learn knowledge um, in, in a detailed manner. But if you're just a general person who's just learning fiqh in general, then you don't really need to focus uh, too much on where the madhab is coming from or not. It's important for you just to know that you're taking fiqh from the great Imam, Imam Ibn Qudam al maqdisi and that will suffice you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward everybody immensely that attended and make your journey in seeking knowledge beneficial and easy and hugely uh, and full of huge rewards and give us the motivation to continue and to implement as much as we can and jazakumullah